Good afternoon. Welcome to uh, the eighth in a series of clinical conversations that MCPAP is sponsoring. Um, they all take place on the fourth Tuesday of each month from 12.15 to 1.15. I apologize for being a little late today. Um, and as a caution, I will let you know that we had previously lost our internet this morning. So if for some reason um, the webinar stops abruptly, that will be why. Um, and if that should happen, we will certainly reschedule for another time. Um, thanks for joining us today. Our topic is Risk Assessment, Preventing Youth Suicide in Primary Care. Primary care. Um, um, we are going to be recording this session so that it will be available later on our MCPAP website at www.mcpap.org along with a copy of the PowerPoint slides um, which will be under archive news and webinars under the About MCPAP page on the website. Um, we're going to hold uh, questions and answers until the end, um, and we will make sure that there's plenty of time for that. Um, if you have a question or comment, please type it into the question box during the presentation or click the raise hand button on your webinar toolbox. We will read out your question or unmute your line to enable you to ask that question um, during the Q&A session. You're also going to receive a very brief survey following the presentation, and we appreciate if you could just take two minutes to fill that out and send it back to us. It helps us improve our webinars for the future. Um, we're really thrilled um, today to have with us um, an expert on uh, suicide uh, risk assessment in primary care, Dr. Linda Wright. Um, uh, um, I'm sorry, uh, Dr. Linda, yes, right, Hemac, who um, graduated as a Michael DeBakey Scholar from Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, Texas, and completed Harvard's Medicine and Pediatrics Residency in Boston, Massachusetts. Um, she joined the Wright Center in um, 2000 and became president and CEO in 2012. I'm sorry, it's Dr. Linda Thomas Hemac from the Wright Center. <laughs> I got that confused. Um, and she's been a, the program director for uh, the well-accredited internal medicine residency program since 2007. Dr. Thomas Hemac teaches and practices primary care as a duly board-certified internal medicine and pediatrics physician in our hometown of Archibald um, at the Wright Center for Primary Care in Mid Valley in Pennsylvania. She's a committed advocate of the patient-centered medical home delivery model promoting patient and community empowerment constructive consumerism and patient self-management in an environment emphasizing team-based care delivery. Um, we actually postponed the webinar from last month in order to be able to have Dr. Thomas Hemac with us today. Um, she's so passionate about this topic. We did have um, up on the screen for you her full bio, which is very lengthy. Um, so. Um, we will. We also have with us Dr. Bruce Waslick, who is the medical director of our McPath Bay State team, and um, and he is going to be available um, for those uh, questions and discussion issues around um, uh, medications and um, things that that are are more um, the kinds of things that you would be calling McPath to consult on, and myself. Uh, Marcy Ravitch, who's the and I'm the MIPAP director. I'm also a social worker, um, and I'm going to move right on um, to get started. Um, so, Dr. Hemac, uh, Thomas Hemac, um, her work at the Wright Center has been funded by the Garrett Lee Smith Memorial Suicide Prevention Act, which originated in 2004 and was reauthorized in 2015. Our own Massachusetts Department of Public Health received a Garrett Lee Smith grant to pilot a suicide program in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, and it's a new model called Zero Suicide. It is a suicide prevention model specifically focused on health care. Um, and um, 
we're really actually fortunate that we postponed the presentation because in the interim, the American Academy of Pediatrics published a recent report by Benjamin Shane on adolescent suicide. Um, we hope that you've all had a chance to look at this report. It's been widely disseminated over the past couple, couple of weeks. Um, Dr. Shane is quoted as saying that the main goal of this report is to help pediatricians become more aware and screen adolescents for suicide. The report urges pediatricians to screen youth for suicidal thoughts and provide access to community resources and referrals to mental health professionals, which was our very purpose in having this webinar to begin with. We've woven some of the points from the report into our discussion today, and we're pleased that the report highlights the need for collaborative care with mental health professionals and notes that um, primary care pediatricians should be comfortable screening patients for suicide, mood disorders, and substance abuse and dependence, which is what we at MCPAP have been um, hoping to teach all along and be here to support you all in doing. So uh, with all of that lengthy introduction, Dr. Wright, um, I'm wondering if you could um, paint a picture for us about what's happening nationally. There, there are lots of different statistics and um, wondering what you can tell us about that. Um, on the screen at this point, suicide is a serious public health problem, um, and it has increased in the past uh, since the National Strategy on Suicide Prevention was developed 15 years ago. Most importantly, it is the second leading cause of death for 10 to 14 year olds and 15 to 24 year olds following unintentional injury for both age groups as number one. And the reality is that um, unintentional injury may also be suicidal attempts that are just not documented. Um, between 2013 and 2014, suicide moved from the third leading cause of death to the second leading cause of death for 10 to 14 year olds. Um, in Massachusetts, um, the 2013 youth risk behavior YRDS, the Youth Risk Behavior Survey, um, show the statistics you can see on your screen. Um, and again, it's really a public health problem. Um, um, for this age group. Um, I know that Dr. Um, Thomas Hemack's experience at the Wright Center um, was that her, her experience shows prevalence similar to what was reported in the AAP report. 37% depression, 36% anxiety, 22% trauma, and 17% suicidality. Dr. Thomas? Marcy, I'm here. Oh, Linda, can you hear me? Excellent. Um, yes. Okay. So, um, and then the, the next couple slides are just a couple of slides for you all to look at um, about the, the statistics here in Massachusetts. Thank you to the Department of Public Health, um, Department of Suicide Prevention for providing these for us. Um, and this just will give you a sense of where you are in the state what the statistics on suicide look like. So, Dr. Thomas Hemack, now that we have you back, when did suicide become a primary care concern? So, hi, Marcy. You can call me Linda. It'll be easier. <laughs> and um, 
you know, I think it's always been a primary care concern. Um, I think that we are coming as a nation to more transparent disclosure, and we're overcoming a lot of the stigma and taboos about suicide, and we're beginning to really generate um, a lot of community-based conversations about its impact, and you know how all of those graphs that you showed um, translate the national public health crisis um, into the meaning um, for families and communities. Uh, there's been a lot of research. You know, I give the American Academy of Pediatrics a lot of credit um, for their visionary paper calling a national awareness amongst pediatricians and public health agencies, and also just primary care in general. Um, to what is our public health crisis and what we have to collectively own. Um, I think one of the most striking um, impetus that's come from the public health literature is the fact that you know more almost 50 percent of patients who commit suicide um, have been in direct contact with the primary care delivery system uh, within the month before their death. Certainly a much higher percentage of them within a year prior to committing suicide. And, you know, really shockingly, 20% of them have actually touched the mental health system. So, you know, it's very powerful that one of the most well-documented and common factors amongst people who successfully commit suicide has been their contact with the healthcare delivery system, um, and particularly with the primary care system. So I think there's um, really been generated a national conversation about those humbling statistics. Um, that are kind of a game changer in terms of our stepping up as a profession to overcome what a lot of times is a lot of fear or stigma to really come to the conversation um, of being part of, you know, generating the solution. So um, it's been a long road. You know, it's just it's, we're at a very different, transparent place as a nation recognizing the crisis. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to talk for a moment about this whole new zero suicide approach. Um, uh, one conference I went to described it as a big, hairy, audacious goal. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, what you can tell us about it since you've been working on this for a few years. So I think when you uh, open up what we refer to as a Pandora's box, particularly in primary care, and you know, we start the process of screening for mental health issues and addictions and suicide risk. It generates a lot of fear um, because the trenches of primary care are extremely busy um, and the workforce hasn't necessarily yet caught up in terms of acquiring the skill sets we need uh, when we get a positive screen. So, you know, when you start the process of introducing screening for what is now a public health crisis and you're stepping out of the town hall and you're trying to come into more of a strategy before the crisis, um, and then you put a goal out that calls people to, okay, let's rally around elimination of this problem and let's aim for zero. You know, you have to be very cautious about how we begin that conversation so that people feel really empowered to address the problem and not scared of failing to meet what might be unachievable in terms of a zero suicide goal. And, you know, it's just the conversation, it's a yin and a yang, you know, because the people that are anxious about the zero suicide approach and being called to a never-ending journey of promoting awareness, screening, and getting into preventative efforts, um, you know, the opposite side of kind of just, you know, accepting that big, hairy, audacious goal is ours, um, it's kind of just this um, fearful place of, you know, accepting that one is acceptable. Uh, and I, I think that as a profession, we've kind of um, moved into acknowledging the big, hairy, audacious goal, and we're getting a lot more courageous, recognizing that we can do things like this, you know, collaborate between Massachusetts and Pennsylvania, and that there's a whole lot of people um, interested, and that we have resources at our discretion, and that collectively, um, it's a lot less frightening. Thank you. Um, I just want to mention that we do have two pilots going on in Massachusetts um, uh, as part of our Zero Suicide Learning Collaborative that's led by the Department of Public Health here in Massachusetts. Um, we received a Garrett Lee Smith USI Suicide Prevention Grant from SAMHSA. Um, and the pilot sites are at Haywood Hospital and Berkshire Health Systems. So if we have anyone on the call who's from those areas, 
um, perhaps during the Q&A, you can let us know how it's going for you there. Um, I want to take a moment. Um, we all know that um, uh, we live particularly in primary care with the shadow of the black box warnings around antidepressant medications and suicide risk. And I wanted um, to ask Dr. Waslick to just um, speak to that for a minute. Um, particularly, how do you deal with parents who are reluctant for their children to use medications because of this black box warning? And, and how does that relate to um, the risk for suicide? Sure. I mean, I'll, I'll just take a couple minutes and I'll be happy to answer questions uh, at the end. So, um, you know, as we will, as we study suicidality, I mean, we understand that one of the big risk factors for suicide attempts, suicidal thinking, completed suicide, is actually a mental health problem. And one of the foremost mental health problems is depression. Um, so, on the one hand, we worry about sort of the, the negative sequelae of depression being, you know, all kinds of things like just, you know, increasing distress, subjective distress, a decrease in functioning, um, and a lot of the time we think of depression as a uh, quality of life issue, but depression also has a life and death quality to it. So, um, we, we know that one of the possible outcomes of, of depression untreated is suicide attempts, suicidal behavior. Uh, we've been living since 2004 really with the uh, black box warning around uh, the use of antidepressant medications for a variety of conditions besides depression, including anxiety, OCD, eating disorders, things like that. Uh, but the black box warning specifically speaks to the risk of um, a small number of individuals who may have an adverse reaction to the antidepressant being pre uh, prescribed with worsening of depression, uh, suicidal thinking, and or suicidal behavior. Uh, the FDA weighed a lot of evidence uh, prior to making this uh, black box warning, uh, and the evidence really comes from clinical trials of antidepressants that were done mostly between the years 1990 and 2003, um, and looking at you know the number of kids who uh, got into suicidal crises while they were taking medication versus the numbers uh, who were, uh, who, when they were taking placebo, and surprisingly, really surprising, I remember at the time, very surprised that this found a signal of increased uh, suicidal crises, um, at, which were, were showing up in the adverse events data uh, to, with the kids who were on antidepressants compared to the kids on placebo, which we would have thought the, or expected the exact opposite. We would have thought antidepressants were helping kids and reducing this suicide risk. Um, but there does appear to be a very, very small number of kids who have almost paradoxical reactions to antidepressants where at times depression can get worse and uh, um, uh, they can develop suicidal thinking or behavior. Um, fortunately, the risk is small. The absolute risk is about 2%, so 1 in 50. When I talk to parents, I give them the numbers. I say, you know, it's a 1 in 50 risk, 49 uh, out of 50 kids are not going to have problems related to suicidality. Uh, one in 50 might. And if that's happening and if the kids are, you know, developing these things, it may be a sign that they're not tolerating the medication. Um, I think the challenge is that, you know, sometimes kids are presenting already with depression and suicidality and, you know, people who are prescribing the medications do have to weigh the balance of the, the, the uh, potential suicide risk with the under, underlying disorder, which is often depression, but can be anxiety and other types of conditions, versus the potential benefits uh, of uh, the medication. So it's a, it's a somewhat complicated clinical decision. Um, the FDA did not prohibit the use of antidepressant medications, and they are still used. They are used by psychiatrists. They are used by specialized mental health practitioners. They are used uh, in a continual fashion uh, by primary care doctors. And I've done a number of phone consultations and in-person consultations with the MCPAP program regarding these type of questions. I started a kid on an antidepressant about two weeks later. They seem to be worse. You know, how do I know that the medication is, um, you know, not, uh, not causing the worsening? Uh, it's a complex clinical uh, situation. And I think it is something that uh, uh, McPap can help primary care doctors sort out and give sort of methods for being able to do that. 
Um, the FDA did look at a variety of other uh, factors which might be involved with the uh, the uh, risk of developing this adverse reaction, including demographic demographic factors, clinical factors, um, medication itself factors, and the only risk factor appears to be age. So if uh, if somebody is 25 and under. Uh, they're in the risk group for having this adverse reaction. If they're old, over 25, uh, they are not in the risk group. So the risk group, uh, after initially being evaluated in children and adolescents, was evaluated throughout the, uh, the life course uh, up into adults and older adults. And it seems the only predictable factor we can find as a risk factor for this is age. So, and the age is cut off at the age of uh, 25 and under. Um, again, I'm going to stop, and I'm happy to answer questions uh, after we complete the presentation uh, from anybody who has questions. Thank you. Um, so uh, what can a primary care provider do in his or her office? We know we have universal behavioral health screening here in Massachusetts. Both the pediatric symptom checklist and the PHQ-9 include suicide questions. Um, and so everybody should be screening. We know those are the two most common tools used to screen here. So if you get a positive, uh, Linda, then what? Uh, so I really like this slide. I, I think it's one of the slides that we co-created that has the most value because I think once the primary care doctors come to these types of conversations, particularly you know um, the pediatricians who step up to come to the table, they're going to be willing um, to engage. And I think what we need is a concrete strategy of what we can do um, in the middle of being really busy, um, trying to live in the industry of healthcare, which is obviously really dramatically changing every day. Um, and things get very complex, computers, team building, medical home pursuits, new employers, new metrics that we answer to. So I think this, you know, boiling it down to the six concrete things that um, we can really give as like a roadmap um, to the practicing physicians is really important. Um, you know, obviously just learning the warning signs and symptoms and continuing um, to develop ourselves professionally by learning more about suicide and what are the predictive risk factors. Um, and if we do begin to screen um, what are the warning signs is extremely important. This comes to the next slide and then we'll go back um, to the six things a primary care doctor can do. but. You know, um, recognizing when uh, in, in the workflow, when somebody begins to um, talk about or make plans for suicide, just um, general conversation in the room about friends who have committed suicide, things that adolescents have been exposed to, expressing hopelessness, um, screening positive on the quick screens for depression or um, substance use or behavioral risks that we put into place in an evidence-based way in the office. Um, displaying severe overwhelming emotional pain or distress or complicated dynamics with their support system when they're there for their visits. Um, and obviously any expression of concern about the behavior or mood of one of our patients from not only their family members but also our staff. I think increasing our staff awareness um, to pay attention. You know, I've had, since we began the screening process, I've had several days where my medical assistant came out of workflow to say to me, I'm worried about that patient because in the rooming in process, um, she's recognized cues um, or clues or a request for help that may not come from, in a straightforward ask. Um, Marcy, I think we can go back um, to the six things the PCP can do. So, you know, staying mindful, never getting lax, always being um, engaging and looking in the eyes of our patients and recognizing um, that it's very important. I think implementing the universal screens, there's plenty of them out there, so generating consensus amongst your providers of what are the screens that you will choose and making sure that all of the staff recognize um, what it means to have a positive screen, what it looks like. Um, deeper diving, when if you choose a quick screening route, um, the PHQ-2, you know, with the two depression question, what do you do when you get a positive? And understanding the deeper dive assessment and the strategy for when you get the first positive. And then most importantly, um, what happens in the middle of really busy workflow um, when you uncover side risk and um, knowing how you're going to react within your workflow as a team to the positive screen. Um, because certainly one of the things that frightens all of us 
is what happens when something the unexpected happens and are we prepared to deal with it? So, you know, really looking at the workforce skills, um, there are some general terms in, um, you know, the suicide and behavioral uh, risk world, uh, collaborative safety planning. What does it mean when you get a positive screen to generate a crisis response plan with a patient? And that sounds like a big, hairy, audacious goal just in terms of just one thing that you do when you get a positive screen. But you know what? With skill set development, that can be done very expeditiously with a team so that the provider who has detected the risk feels confident that the system is going to pick up the ball and help him or her to get this patient what they need. And looking at your primary care workforce um, skills, just in terms of lethal means reduction, getting the language in the office about is there gun or knife exposure, okay? And, you know, just the quick sentence to the parents about we've got to reduce the lethal means access, and that includes pills in the medicine cabinet, guns in the closet, okay, knives, anything um, that could potentially be utilized for suicide. And most importantly, number five, really talks about building the system within your office for what do you do with the child or the adolescent who's in front of you when they screen positive, who is the warm handoff to, how do you generate the referral, how do you communicate within the referral, is it urgent or is it a past history of suicidality, you know, suicidality that um, is a little bit less urgent and doesn't require the immediate response but does need to be tagged in a referral of that patient because they are high risk and there needs to be referral tracking so that that doctor knows, you know what, we generated the referral and guess what, they showed up for the appointment, they're good. How do you give that primary care doctor the comfort that they need to be sure that they didn't open up Pandora's box, okay, and now they feel responsible and then the ball gets dropped by the system to not get the patient what they need. I think having um, MCPAP in Massachusetts is very powerful. I really appreciate that last, um, you know, conversation about the resources that are available for the primary care guys because um, very quickly when you kind of come out and you step out on the ledge and you get into behavioral health risk, um, you know, you need to be prepared with who are your lifelines and who can you call. Yeah, and I just want to interrupt for a second and mention that um, here in Massachusetts we have an emergency services program. So if you have someone in your office that you feel is at imminent risk, um, you can always um, call the mobile crisis intervention team, which is specific for pediatrics. They'll come right to your office or to the child's home. Um, unfortunately, it's only for kids with Medicaid um, and a few teams that contract with a few commercial payers, but mostly for Medicaid. And that information is um, on the resource page at the end of the presentation, so you'll all have access to that. So, you know, that's very powerful, and I think just these public health initiatives and organizing the activity to make crisis hotlines um, available so that everybody knows, and, you know, really having the resources to back them like you've set up in the state of Massachusetts so that when somebody calls, they actually get a response. That's very powerful. Great. I know that you have um, you've done some work in your um, in your practice around crisis response. Um, what you know? How do you how do you deal with that? So um, actually, forthright in the next, I, I think um, Marcy, in the next slide, if we can just jump slides because I'd, I'd like to show people because I I think uh, this is a very powerful slide. Um, this is actually the summative document that we get. So we chose the Garrett Lee Smith um, Comprehensive Behavioral Health Risk Screening. It was brought to us by one of the federal grantees, and it was a tool that we were easily able to integrate into our workflow, and it's very comprehensive. Most of the work is actually done at the level um, of the staff and the medical assistants engaging um, in a conversation that's obviously supported by the pediatrician with the parents about we screen everyone. This is just part of our workflow and we are trying to generate conversations for your adolescents that otherwise um, might be considered out of scope. Um, we are now putting that in the scope of primary care and we share the 
the statistic that we used earlier, about 50% of at-risk adolescents or adolescents that commit suicide um, touch a primary care office, and we think that's important and we want to partner with you. And this is part of how we take great care of your kids. So we do the behavioral health risk screen, and it's a comprehensive screen. You know, it takes um, several minutes for the family and um, the adolescent to do on a tablet by themselves. And, you know, it would be very difficult for me as a primary care doctor to go through every single detailed question and the answer and to process all that in the time allotment that we have. So this is a really powerful front um, summative document that we get on every child who completes the screen. And you can see, like, right in the middle is really the substance of it, okay? It will tell us, like, is this person at mild, at uh, risk for mild, moderate, or severe depression? The same about anxiety. It tells us about suicidality, whether it's current, um, which is obviously an acute intervention opportunity, or past, um, which is more of an elective referral opportunity. Are they at risk for PTSD and trauma? Um, and do they, you know, have an eating disorder or a substance abuse issue? And, you know, in the beginning when we put this screen out, we were very worried about what the public was going to think, what the parents were going to think, um, was there going to be people who didn't want their children exposed. I can tell you um, that we have not had any refusal to participate in the behavioral risk screening, and we have an, we've had amazing step up by the staff um, to actually lead this because of the significance. And on the next page, and, you know, my, the medical assistants know that if they see a positive, to bring it to the attention of the provider because we get busy and we're looking in ears and we're treating sinusitis and um, we're addressing, you know, um, other forms of trauma, just sometimes motor vehicle, whatever happens, my medical assistant knows, our medical assistant knows, when you see a positive, that's an important health issue, flag the pediatrician and bring it to their attention. And this is what you were asking about, Margie, with what do we do when we get a positive? This is, um, we've innovated a lot around this in terms of how to simplify the process of what does the pediatrician do with the positive? And so we really worked on developing quick skill sets um, for a very brief intervention to um, establish a crisis response. Who is the crisis response advocate? Is it the parent? Is it a friend? Um, is it a relative of the family? Is it a counselor? Um, to identify that person and to really explain that this is, a, this is our alternative of what we used to say to patients when I first trained 20 years ago was, can you sign this and verbally commit to safety? And, you know, we know that that gave the doctor's peace of mind, but it didn't always um, really give the patient a plan. So this is a new alternative. And it basically says to them, you know, if, if you were to call this person to help you to change your thinking and support you away from harming yourself, what would be the reason that you like to be alive and that you would never do that? And you could see on the top, you know, I have a future, I like music, I love my family, I have religious, you know, um, beliefs that preclude me from ever committing suicide. So kind of listing those out in a conversation with the patient, having them name the person that they trust that they would call, and making them understand that it's really important that that person recognize that that's their role in their life so that, you know, and I tell, I tell crisis response advocates all the time, if you see a phone call from this person, this isn't the one you roll to voicemail, you know, particularly in the near future. And then you can see down the bottom just the reminder to the pediatrician to kind of go through the lethal means reduction of, because it, it sounds so obvious, but in a very busy office when somebody discloses risk, you know, people get frightened. And so they, they need a checklist. This is our checklist, you know, check for guns in the house, check for firearms, knives, and medications in the cabinet, check for the resources, connect with the crisis response advocate so that we have a plan and that that plan is a conversation and a process of shared decision making between a patient and a doctor and a family. Um, and so this is one of the tools, and we're very proud to just bring it here. We, we'd like calls after this or emails after the webinar if people have questions, because we're still learning about how to do this most effectively. Um, that was a great explanation. Thank you. I think that was really helpful. Um, I'm going to skip over the story for a moment, just in the interest of time, and go right to lessons learned. Um, it sounds like you have had a great deal of experience implementing um, suicide prevention in your primary care settings, 
And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about what you feel has been most successful and what has been most challenging. Um, I'm, I'm also particularly wondering about how you um, included all of these activities into the existing workflow of the practices um, in your system. I know that's always an issue for our primary care providers. So I think just in terms of lessons learned, they're summarized here to share with everybody. But I think the things that have really worked well is that when the pediatricians came to the table and they really have the opportunity to have a conversation like this and to reflect and to look at the statistics and to be able and to recognize the link between those national statistics and their patients who they really care about, um, they have unanimously stepped up. And when the pediatricians have stepped up and the, the team leaders have stepped up, um, the staff have really rallied because um, when they understand the meaning of what we're talking about in terms of the people who come to the clinics that are our patients and the families and we know each other and we're living in the same communities, um, the majority of people in the healthcare delivery system come to work every day um, wanting to take really good care of patients. And when they understand and they recognize and they're called to a conversation and they're given the tools and the resources, they will rally and they will integrate it um, so that you begin to create a culture where it would almost feel like you weren't doing a great job to not scream and to not ask the question. And so what's been really beautiful is that this whole public education campaign and staff development around this and the engagement of patients and families has really generated a culture of um, part of taking really good care of um, children and adolescents is to really get over our fear as a profession and our fear of never getting to the zero suicide risk and to really be constructive about it and to embrace it and it fit really nicely into our medical home workflow, um, which was essentially built around chronic illness and you know bringing this into it um, brings prevention and a strategy for behavioral health and so um, I will share that um, it has generated a lot of hope um, and a lot of conversation about how can we take all the energy of reacting to the tragedy and really getting into um, being the game changers and rallying about around doing what's good for our patients. So that's been awesome. Um, people stepping up has been awesome. Parental acceptance and patient acceptance has been humbling. Um, there's enough general consensus now about the suicide epidemic, the opioid epidemic, um, that I, I think the nation is looking to the profession of medicine to lead and to come forth with solutions like this. Um, and I think that when you get it right and you start, you know, preventing and you start screening and you find one and one person, one starfish story that you can intervene with and make a difference with, and you see how different it can be than if that stuff happens. Yeah. And I think that makes people feel really empowered to come to work and, and um, really motivated to change the way that we deliver care and to cross the chiasms of what we're afraid of and to really get into more comprehensive health assessments um, that include behavior and behavioral risk. That's wonderful. Thank you. Um, and I think it's particularly um, I'm not sure what the word I'm looking for is, but uh, powerful that you've done all this without a program like MCPAP. Um, although I will mention that there's about to be one in Pennsylvania starting. I think it just started in July. So um, I'm wondering if you've used any of the mobile resources that are now available. I know SAMHSA launched um, something called Suicide Safe. I, you know, it seems to be... Um, I don't know, I'm getting a lot of emails about it lately, um, or one of the other ones. I'm wondering, you know, if you've used them or what you think about them. So um, we used a lot of technology. You know, we were not actually, and I, I just want to put this out there, we did all this as part of our medical home innovations, and even though we did it in collaboration with SAMHSA grantees, we didn't actually get, like, the direct resources or a big, you know, financial investment in the right center. Like, 
we did this redesigning um, the current resources that we had to take better care of the patients. So this is possible without a lot of like resource investment. Um, if it's strategically designed and if you get the leadership and, the, and the, particularly the pediatrician buy-in. Um, in terms of IT technology, most of the resources that we have used are our own electronic medical record and prompting system. We've built a lot of it into the workflow of our EMR. Um, but we have just begun to explore um, the resources of SAMHSA's Garrett Lee Smith grant. They have a lot of technology. And obviously, that technology is linked to Suicide Safe, which is the new, newly released SAMHSA mobile app. So um, one of the great things about meeting people like you, Marcy, and learning about the MAC um, initiative in Massachusetts is that we learn too. So uh, we have a lot of learning to do around mobile technology. And we haven't done a lot of exploration, but we're really excited about it. And we're a lot smarter about it because you brought our attention to it. Great, thank you. I um, I wanted to mention to folks that um, in in the PowerPoint, which will be available um, on our website, there's um, a list of resources for all of you PCPs and for patients. Um, there's actually a couple pages of them, so you might want to take a look at that after the webinar. Um, do we have any questions? Okay, well, I'll tell you what, this is a good time to go back to the starfish story, and while um, Linda's talking about the starfish story, we can, um, people can type in their questions. Linda, do you want to actually quickly talk about your starfish story? So, you know, um, the starfish story is just, you know, taking the public health initiative and really bringing it down to your daily workflow where you deliver a really great preventative health effort and behavioral health risk screening and you help one patient at a time. So we had a starfish story with somebody that we intervened with and we screened, she came up positive. Um, there was a lot of um, parental denial around her mental health issues and the crisis that she was going through. And we were able to educate the patient and later the family about um, a lot of the laws around confidentiality and the fact that um, adolescents are able to access resources um, without parental consent when there is a mental health and a substance abuse issue. So I'm going to tell that story. But um, Marcy, the one that I think is more powerful is the fact that you know, I recently went to, and I'll be really quick, but I recently went to a conference and I met this person next to me who lives in the town and I didn't know her before and she told me that in February she was out on her porch and she heard some screams at 4 o'clock in the afternoon on a Sunday from the local park. She wanted to run in her house and deny it, but of course she's a parent and wanted to do the right thing, so she ran into the park. And when she ran there, she saw a 16-year-old and she was crying with the cell phone, not having the wit to call for help. And next to her was her 16-year-old boyfriend hanging from the dugout from a shoestring. And this person ended up, you know, burning. Um, she said, I never was so happy I was a smoker. She took out the lighter, burned the shoestring. Kids got up, dropped down. She resuscitates him. He lives. Six weeks later, he's got a little bit of neurological impairment, but he's at her door to thank her. She's telling me this all at a music concert that I was at with my adolescent, you know. She's telling me about how, you know, six for till now, you know, till May when I met her, um, how she had to go to therapy to get the images that out of her head for PTSD. And I, I tell that story to kind of say that, um, you know what, this is all around us. Never say never your kid. It's in our community. Um, it's amongst all of our youth. They are our future. And when a suicide happens, um, the repercussions of that on families and communities is enormous. And it's just contagious, and um, it's much bigger than just the numbers that you see, which sometimes might look small. But I do think it rallies us around is um, one is too many, and um, we really need to get on board nationally with zero suicide, safe carry out nation's goal, um, because it's going to touch all of us. Thank you. That was a really. T I remember you telling me that story previously, and I, I actually had asked that you talk about it because I think it's a very powerful story. Um, we have a couple of questions. This first one is actually a comment 
from our colleague, Alan Holmland, who's the director of the Suicide Prevention Unit at the Department of Public Health. Um, Massachusetts has a toll-free number available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, operated by Samaritans that youth can either text or call. And that number is 877-870-4673. That is also listed in our resources at the end of the PowerPoint. This is a question, I believe, for Dr. Wozlick. Is it more likely to develop side effects of suicidal ideation in the first few months of SSRI use and with dose change, or can this medical side effect develop really at any time? Well, it's a great question. I mean, the uh the information, the data that led to the black box warnings were all, for the most part, 12, 8 to 12 week studies of antidepressants in, in kits. So they were randomized controlled trials lasting about 8 to 12 weeks. And that's where the suicide signal first showed up, and that's the one the FDA decided to warn the public about. Um, there's been very few good studies longer term. But in one of the studies I was involved with, with the TAD study, we did see some kids who had adverse reactions to antidepressants that were related to suicidality beyond 12 weeks, because this, uh, this included a longitudinal follow-up component. They weren't as many as there were in the first 12 weeks. So the general caution is monitor kids throughout the course of time while they're in, on antidepressants, um, but even the FDA suggested closer monitoring at the beginning of treatment um, while the kids are acclimating to the medications. And I think it's prudent to monitor them closely uh, after dose uh, adjustment as well, because the two times we tend to see side effects of any kind with medications are when you first start the medication or when you make a dose change. Thank you. Um, the next, um, it's not another comment, that's not a question, but this is very powerful. This is from um, uh, Timothy Sweeney at um, Haywood Healthcare, one of the pilot sites for the Zero Suicide Youth Prevention Grant. I love and commend the comments about the fact that an overwhelming majority of healthcare professionals come to work every day intent upon delivering excellent care to their community. Here at Haywood Healthcare, our awareness of the need for better screening and resources happen through the loss of one of our own to suicide. Thank you. Very moving, thank you. Those are actually all the questions we have right now. Um, if anyone else would like to ask a question, please um, type into the question box. Um, in the meantime, any final words, Linda or Bruce? I want to thank you for this opportunity. It's been a very powerful experience, and um, we are inspired by the outreach. And um, we do think that you know, Spider Webs can call the lion, and you know, it's going to be um, as a nation. We have a lot of resources and a lot of opportunities kind of generate um, a collective approach um, that we can bring down to a community level to benefit our patients and families that we are privileged to take care of. Um, it's very powerful, so thank you. Thank you, and thank you for joining us. Um, I want to just reiterate that at any time, you can call McPAP if you have a question or you're concerned about a youth in your care. Um, of course, if it's an imminent risk, you can also call, again, the mobile crisis team if it's a child with Medicaid. And I will repeat the Samaritan's um, number, 877 870-4673, uh, which stands for HOPE, um, and thank our presenters today. I would let folks know that um, we are going to have our next clinical conversation um, possibly in late August, but definitely in September. As you may or may not know, we are recontracting 
with our MCPAP teams. And so we'll have some information for you about those changes upcoming in our newsletter that will come out in August. And then our next webinar will not be a clinical conversation, but more of an administrative conversation to update you on the changes that we're making, hopefully for the better, to serve you better. And um, thank you all again for joining us. And please take a moment to fill out the survey um, after the webinar when it comes. Have a great day. Thank you.